In this episode, my colleague Mike Shemansky and I are joined by Dr. D.J. Barrett, a plastic surgeon and prolific early stage healthcare investor. In a discussion that lasts just over 45 minutes, we uncover a lot of wisdom and insights Dr. Barrett has developed in over a decade of investing. We talk about the filters he uses to identify interesting investment candidates, his diligence process, and some of the characteristics he looks for in a company and its management. Without further ado, Let's jump into this episode of Innovation for Alpha. You're listening to Innovation for Alpha, where we explore everything at the intersection of healthcare innovation and finance. Through our discussions and interviews, we keep you informed and educated about healthcare innovations, next level venture investing, and everything involving the combination of the two. Welcome, everybody. This is Tobin Arthur with Innovation for Alpha, and I am joined by my colleague, Mike Shemansky. And today we are very pleased to have Dr. G.J. Verrett out of Dallas, Texas. He's a plastic surgeon, a great guy, an active investor, has a lot of great experience to share with physicians who are interested in the process of working with startups, whether it is investors, advisors, etc. So welcome, D.J. Thanks for uh, being with us today. Well, thanks for having me, Tobin. I'm excited to uh, talk about something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. Well, speaking of that, you and I have had uh, lots of conversations along with Mike over, over time about the investing process. Maybe start off giving us your kind of general philosophy and maybe tie that to your experience, because I think that gives people a sense of, of how much you've actually been involved in this space. Yeah, so just a little bit of background. As you mentioned, I'm a facial plastic surgeon in Dallas. Uh, did med school and residency here. Got my undergrad in biomedical engineering, which is, I think, kind of important to evaluating some of these companies we're looking at. And went out on my own, started a practice from scratch back in 2008, probably the worst time to start a business recent in recent history, except maybe a restaurant last year, and, and have been solo practice ever since. About 10 years ago, though, you know, after two or three years in practice and, and things started going pretty well. I had already, I grew up, my father was or is a State Farm insurance agent. He's a financial planner. He has all the certifications. So we talked finances growing up. And in, in, even in medical school, I sat down and developed a retirement plan. And I think that is fundamental for every physician is you, you need to have a financial plan for a whole lot of reasons. But the first thing is to develop a sound financial plan. Look at when you want to retire, what savings you need, what your expenses may be along the way. And obviously things change, but have a, have a sound financial plan. And then, you know, after that, I said, well, listen, I, maybe I don't want to work until I'm 65 and started looking around and realized there are a lot of opportunities that potentially I can accelerate that retirement timeline. And, and one of them that I looked at, which seemed to be pretty good, was startup investing. It seemed to be very high risk, but potentially very high reward. So, you know, about 10 years ago, I started using money after my retirement plan. I think that is fundamental. I see a lot of discussion in physician discussion boards about, oh, everybody needs real estate and everybody needs this and everybody needs that. The reality is, you know, it, it's as a physician, when I see a patient, let's say with diabetes, not every patient with diabetes needs the same treatment. And similarly, in finances, not every physician needs the same treatment plan. We should really look at it as a history and physical. The history being, where do you want to be? Where, what kind of obstacles do you have? The physical exam being, what does your money look like today? And then a plan for the future. And it needs to be individualized for everybody. And, and so for me, I started looking at it and I decided that startup investing was a good idea. But, you know, I, I think it's also very important. A lot of times people talk about, physicians talk about passive income. So we want to be able, we have a full-time day job. We are very, you know, CME and, and nine to five job, and then five hours of note taking after that. It, it's extremely busy. So we talk about passive income and, and truly, I firmly believe the only truly passive investment is a large mutual or a mutual fund and a large index, like an S&P 500 mutual fund or an S&P ETF or a whole market mutual fund. Otherwise, you really need to treat investing as a second job. And if you start investing in real estate or you start investing in startup companies, you really need to take it as a second job and do your research. 
even if you decide to invest in a fund of funds or, or a startup fund like you guys have, it's still very important to know who you're investing with, what their motto is, what they invest with, what their history is, and what they're going to invest in for you, because that's going to determine what your returns are. And in the startup realm, you know, it's also very important. I have a couple of rules that I followed as I got involved and have kind of expanded upon. First and foremost, I only invest money that I'm willing to lose a hundred percent of because these companies, I have several companies that went to zero. I lost my entire investment. I have a couple of companies that I made 10 times my investment. But when I started the investment, I had the same thesis that they were all going to succeed. And that just simply isn't the case. Second, I, I invest and forget in a way. And I think we, we need to talk about this some more and, and maybe bring in some other thoughts. But when I invest in a startup company, the, the forget part for me is I no longer use that money in a calculation of my retirement finances or my net worth, because that is, to me, that is lost money. And if I make a significant return on it, it accelerates everything else, but I'm only going to realize that return or that investment when I actually have cash in hand. And so I forget it, meaning I don't use it in any of my net worth or retirement calculations. And I think that's pretty, pretty important as well, because let's say you invest a hundred thousand dollars in a company and that company goes to zero, but you've been using it in your calculations of retirement. It, it doesn't do you any good, you know? Um, and by the way, just on that point real quick, that's it. It's really an interesting point, not only for your financial planning, but it also seems to me it gets some of the emotion out of that investment to where you can be a little more objective about whatever your involvement may be. And I'd say the same thing about real estate is that people get sometimes very attached to a particular home or something. And to me, it's just a transaction. And as long as you look at it as a transaction, you can make a little bit more objective, have more objective thinking about it. Yeah. On Wall Street, we use the phrase, uh, don't get married to your positions. Yeah. And it's also difficult because the flip side of that is, especially in startup investing, there are a lot of ups and downs. And so you, you do need to be married and adamant or, or really invested in the thesis of the company. And if the thesis of the company is still sound, then stick with the company. Don't, don't just say, oh, it did an IPO and I can get out at 2X, then, then I'm out because Financially, that's a great return on investment potentially, but if the fundamentals are still absolutely there, even if it goes below the IPO price, it, it may still be a hold. And I have several companies where that's happening to me right now. The, the other thing to, to definitely keep in mind is if you get in the startup realm, as I mentioned, I have companies all over the spectrum and I've invested in over two dozen companies to date. Y you have to diversify. You, you can't just get in and treat this. I think you mentioned earlier, Tobin, you can't treat it as a lottery ticket uh, because it will be a lottery ticket. You're going to lose. That's, that's, that's what's going to happen. But, you know, if you are dedicated, listen, and it's not, I don't have to buy 10 companies in the first year, but I put away maybe $10,000 a year to invest in a startup company. And once a year I invest in a startup company. Well, in 10 years, I have 10 companies. Statistics say two, two out of 10 of those are going to hit it big. And okay, I just, I'm going to make my money back in another five or 10 years. Um, that raises a good question, DJ. Given that you want to diversify, then how do you treat it as a secondary job with all of those companies? You need a hell of a lot of support or a lot of extra time or experience in order to manage that. Well, I mean, that's a good point. And when I invest in these companies, one, I have learned over the years and I, and I don't have all the answers. I'll also say that, but I do have a lot of experience behind me. One is I invest primarily in healthcare because I can tell fairly quickly if the idea is good, if the market is going to be responsive, and I can evaluate that company very quickly. Companies outside of the healthcare sector, I don't understand the economics of as well. I don't understand the markets. I can't evaluate those as well. And my history has proven that out. Two is, it, and kind of in the invest and forget, you know, a, a lot of there, when you invest in these companies, some of them will have ways that you can be actively involved in the company and they will want your active involvement. 
But one of the realities I found is most of the companies really want your money. They don't want your involvement. They want you to write a check for them and they'll come back down the road and they'll ask you for more money as the, the company develops. But a lot of them have their own way of doing things and really involvement past the initial investment isn't that important. Now, one thing I do do though, especially in the startups is at least twice a year, I have either, I will initiate a phone call with management or it, a lot of the companies are good about giving out regular reports, a quarterly report or something like that, telling you how the company's going. But I follow up with them because one of the other truths is if you have a good company, the company will be around and they will always need more money. So don't ever think, oh, I have to get in right now because I'm going to lose the opportunity. The reality is very few times will you actually lose the opportunity. Most of the time you can get in later. Now, it may not be as good of a deal later, but they will have proven out their execution or their ability to execute. And it may de-risk the company a little bit to be able to invest in maybe a little higher valuation with a lot of, a lot of headroom still to make a good profit on it, but with less risk to it. And so I think it is important Two things you're talking about here, DJ. I mean, the, both of them could be a webinar or a conversation in their own right. One is this concept of being the backseat driver versus someone that's actually going to help change the tire. And the other is essentially like, what is the value of follow on rounds and staying on the company and staying liquid in order to pursue those? But I don't want to take you off your topic, but we've got two amazing points there right off the bat. Yeah, no, absolutely. You can't summarize startup investing in a half hour. You guys know that. Of course not, man. Or, or an hour. It, it, you know, it, it's taken me 12 years, 10, 12 years to get where I am. A lot of bumps along the way, and I'm sure there are going to be more bumps down the road. But I, I think, too, you need, you need a strategy. So for me, my strategy is, okay, I've, I have my retirement plan and then I have a certain amount of money above that, that I want to invest each year in startup companies. And fortunately now I, I also get some opportunities because these startups are paying off. And so I can use some of that to reinvest in new startups that are coming along. And there's some tax advantages to qualified small business stock that I can take advantage of there. And that's a whole nother discussion. But when you start doing that, I, I think it's important to, to, to kind of set a theme for what you want to invest in. So for me, the ideal investment, and not everyone's ideal, but the ideal investment is a company that has a significant patent moat around it. They own their intellectual property space, has multiple shots on goal, multiple potential applications for the technology, whatever it is, and has the potential to be a billion dollar company. And those three points are my main thesis in investing in startup companies. And if you match all three of those, then I'm going to spend, or I think you're going to match all three of those, then I'm going to spend significant time doing diligence. I'm going to research the technology. I'm going to make phone calls to, to other investors. I'm going to look into the intellectual property. I'm going to get my lawyers to take a look at things. I'm going to spend time and money doing it because I'm going to invest a large sum of money in those companies. Now, there are other companies, though, that come along that they don't match all of those, but I think it's probably a good idea and it, and it may be okay. So I'm going to invest... I'm going to invest less time and effort doing diligence, but I'm also going to invest less money in it. So I'm, so I may put in 25% of my yearly allocation. I may put in, in that company and then follow it because maybe, because for me, following it becomes part of that diligence process, right? Seeing how management works, seeing how the technology develops, seeing how, how management responds to me as an investor, which is very important. And so I like to invest in individual companies. I like to do that diligence. I think I have enough experience now to, to make my own decisions. For somebody just starting out, I think it's very reasonable, though, to look for funds to invest with or, or potentially invest alongside. 
But as I mentioned, it, if you are going to invest in a fund, then it's very important not to say, oh yeah, Tobin and Mike have have a, a startup fund, they're angel MD, they, they, they've they done great before, and I'm just going to give them $100,000 and let them go to town. Careful, careful now. Come on now. Yes, yes, they will just give us $100,000. That sounds like an awesome idea. Uh, we highly recommend it, by the way. I, and I may do it, but it's important to to sit down and, and call you up and say, hey, let's talk. What's what are you investing in? What's your thesis for investment? You know, do of you course. are you just gonna take everybody that that walks up? What does your deal flow look like? Are you seeing a good swath of companies in, in different areas at different points in time? And and one of probably one of the two most important things I've come to to realize. The reasons, the failures that I've that I've had, have the companies have failed for two reasons. One is management, and two is funding, and they're very closely related. There is a lot of money out there to invest in startups. There was a lot of money out there in 2020. There was a lot of money out there in 2008, but you need to be able to tap into that money. And having management that's able to do it in an efficient way is critical to the success of the company, especially with these startups. Management also is key. I mean, one of the companies that, that I invested in was came out to be a fraud and I've actually filed complaints with the regulatory agencies on it because management was a fraud. What was reported to me and in, in what I diligenced and had paperwork on ended up not being the case management and, and and access to capital to me are the two biggest variables that I can't fully control, but you want to try to kind of check that box whenever you're investing. Hey, I want to just jump back real quick, but before we do, so I want to talk a little bit more about the getting started phase, but before we go there, any thoughts? So as you're with what you've learned over the years, as you think about healthcare, which is a very broad area, do you have preferences, whether it be therapeutics, device, diagnostic, digital health, or are you somewhat neutral on, on that? You know, I'm somewhat neutral in terms of companies I would invest in. I'm not as neutral to how much I would put in them. You know, device companies have basically a cap on what their valuation is going to be. They're never going to be worth what a drug company will be. Drug companies, though, one of the problems there is that most drug companies, not all, in fact, I have a couple of companies that really have platform technologies, but most drug companies are binary events. They're going to develop one drug and one indication. They're going to put it in, they're, they're going to spend 20 or $30 million to get it through a phase one study, and it's going to work or it won't. They will continue on the process. More than likely, they're going to sell to a big drug company after phase one or phase two. Uh, and you'll get your payout, but it's going to be a pretty binary thing. It's going to work or it won't. The company will skyrocket or it'll go to zero. I mean, that's drug companies. Devices, on the other hand, are a little bit more interesting. In fact, I have a, a device company I invested in. They started in one application with the exact same device. They've actually pivoted through two other applications with the exact same device. And they're in a third application from where they started that looks like that's the one that's going to take off and cause the company to, to sell. So I think in devices, there's, there's a lot more application potentially for the technologies. Um, and the technologies that you develop, even if it's not applicable to that specific device, if it's patented correctly, a lot of times you can develop a new device or, or even an application outside of healthcare that the company still survives and you can make your investment back. So I think that's, that's a little different. On the technology front, I've invested in a couple of technology companies. Those are even a bigger roll of the dice in my view. It's the barriers to entry, I think, are the biggest problem in that space. The barriers to entry aren't very high. And there's some behemoths out there that potentially come in and just take you out. You know, if Amazon decides they see your technology, they like it, but they don't want to buy you because you don't play nice with them or whatever, they just go and develop it themselves. And you can't generally get patent protection around most of those technologies. So there's not really a barrier to entry in it. And I think the key in the technology space, and it's pretty much any technology, whether it's healthcare or not, 
is if you have a good technology, you develop it, you, you get as much capital as you can to make the thing skyrocket, and then you sell it off to somebody at a reasonable valuation. If you can't do that, if you're on more of a traditional bootstrapped development, then more than likely somebody else is going to take you out just because they have more money, because the barrier to entry there is just not very high. So I'm a little bit more reticent on the technology front, but, but I have invested in a couple of technologies and they're coming along. We'll see what happens. I think your thoughts on that are pretty simpatico with Mike and I's thinking. So going back just a bit, so starting out, you've been in this for, for a while. And, and so you've built up sources for deal flow processes for how you think about these companies, but for the person who's sitting there where you were a decade ago, thinking this is an interesting space. There's a lot of upside. I understand there's risk. I'll figure out how to best mitigate that risk, but how do they, where do they even jump in? How did you start looking for deals and then realizing that these are good channels for deals? And what was that process? Yeah. So, so good question. My first deal actually was through a physician friend of mine who was investing in startups. And we were talking one day and I said, yeah, I'd like to invest. And, and he brought a deal to me and the technology seemed great. The, the management is not. And even though the company still exists, it has gone nowhere in 13 years. And that I consider my investment zero. Unfortunately, haven't been able to take my stock loss, but that's a whole different story. I think looking back on it, one is you need to network to develop deal flow. That's, that's where my deals come from is networking with people. Now I've developed a reasonable network and have pretty good deal flow. If you're a physician looking to just start out, then, then I think the funds are a good way to go about it. So, you know, Angel and D, obviously you guys are doing a good job in deal flow and starting education programs to, to try and teach people, here's how you do it. Here's what our philosophies are. There are angel networks out there. I mean, do a Google search for angel network. And there are like in the DFW area, we have several angel networks. We have a healthcare incubator that is always looking for investments and mentors to, to help companies along. So I think it, to start, I would look to invest alongside somebody. And I would look again, put in money that I wouldn't be afraid to lose and understand that even though you have experience in it, I mean, my, my second company that went to zero, I invested in three years ago. So it's, it never know for sure. They will go to zero, even with experience in a lot of smart minds behind you, the, the companies will still fail. Real quick on that. You, you made a point a little bit about local angel networks and you're right in DFW, it's a big market. There's a lot going on there. I'm curious though, with your experience, how much is region important? For example, Dallas would not be considered a hotbed of necessarily innovation, although there's a lot. I don't want to disparage that. I'm, but really what I was meaning was markets like Boston, right. San Francisco dominate, mar partly because they've got all the big buyers in these pools. Do you see uh, somebody who's not in Boston or San Francisco? How much do you think about that, at, if at all? Do you see any differences in the types of deals that come out of a Dallas or a St. Louis or a Birmingham? I, I don't see a difference because I'm invested in companies that are in Boston, in San Francisco, in the, the, the especially early stage companies. A friend of mine, in fact, the, the one who has the medical device company is actually a physician, developed a medical device that's on their third iteration that I mentioned. He told me he, before he got his first significant funding, he had done two or 300 presentations before he got to actually a, a reasonable amount of money. So these early stage companies are going to be traveling the country and hitting up anyone and everyone that may be able to give them money. I don't think anymore there's a, you're landlocked in what you have the opportunity to invest in. And especially now that most presentations are virtual, I suspect that'll probably continue. There's no reason you can't join an angel network on the coast if you want to do that. I mean, it, it shouldn't be a real big deal. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think the same thing is true too. We're seeing it's just more efficient for startups. They can actually be very successful out of these markets. Steve Case has been pushing his rise of the REST fund. 
where he essentially is playing the arbitrage of not investing in these very expensive markets, knowing that even Bozeman, Montana, and some of these off markets now are generating companies because frankly, wherever there's an internet connection, for the most part, they can do their work. Mike, you had some thoughts too, just kind of thinking about distribution as an example and some of the things around what are the characteristics and the companies that are taking off? Do you want to dive into those just a little bit? Yeah. One of the things that DJ had mentioned about management and being one of the hurdles and then funding being one of the hurdles. And one of the things that we very often see at Angel MD is that it's actually traction or distribution. Now we're talking specifically about medical device, but also we touched on it regarding digital. I want to stay away from digital because it is a class unto itself, as you mentioned, with zero IP wall around it. But with device, it seems like distribution, traction, overcoming initial adoption reluctance is really the biggest deal. I like to compare it to, you know, I have an iPhone 8. At what point do I upgrade to the iPhone X? Do I go with the 9, the 10, the, you know, the 12? Like, when do I finally ditch my old phone or move to the same one and whether doctors feel the same way with device because they have to integrate it into their new workflow. I think you hit the nail on the head, especially in the device world, distribution is a huge problem. You don't just develop a device and then all of a sudden it shows up everywhere, even if it's really good. And when you look at distribution, you not only have to look at, do the physicians who are going to use the device think it's a good device? but will the hospitals adopt the device? And, and that becomes a business decision. And I've seen it not only in my involvement with hospitals and on different hospital boards, but in my involvement with startup companies looking to get into the hospitals. We had actually spoken earlier about one of the companies that had pitched at the uh, Angel MD Pitch Club and speaking specifically how their distribution models and issue. Now their model, they're looking at addressing going straight to the uh, ambulatory surgery care centers because they feel like that is a lower bar barrier to entry. Yeah, but you got to remember in, in the Dallas market, for instance, a significant number of our ambulatory surgery centers are joint ventures between physicians and hospitals. So the hospitals ultimately control the inventory at the facility. And although the physicians may say, oh, we really want it, we want it, the hospital isn't gonna buy it for one single facility. Um, they're gonna wanna do it for their entire system or a large percentage of their system or something like that. One, you're looking at what devices that are used for a long period of time, you're looking at service contracts. So hospitals are leery to buy into a, a startup company that may not be there in two or three years. So they invested okay. capital in the devices and then the company goes away, they have a device that doesn't work and they can't get service on. So they're reluctant on that front. Two, Wait, there's one point that you mentioned about the surgery center and the hospitals being co like that the surgery centers are actually owned as JVs. Does that impact a lot of the financial decisions for these companies as well? Like given that a product has lower cost but lower margins, if it's being used at an ASC than it is at the hospital, would the hospital system ever consider not implementing it simply because they want to defend their margins at their larger facilities? Potentially, you know, one of the other one of the other things you run into in that facility deal is a lot of times hospitals will have deals, particularly in implants. Mm -hmm. So they'll have a deal that says uh, with maybe Striker, let's say, I'll just pick them out of the blue. Okay, if you use more than 75, if, if the, of the total implants that you put in, more than 75 of them are strike, 75% of them are Striker, we'll give you X percent off your total package cost. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be reluctant to bring in a new implant because it's going to affect the savings they get at the big hospital. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of interplay that you just being the physician working in a surgery center, you may not be aware of that's going to impact whether or not this new device is actually brought in. And, I, and I'll also tell you the purchase cycles for that stuff are long. Just because something is FDA approved doesn't mean the hospital is going to be comfortable using it. Well, I think all of that's what ties back to your original point about the difference between therapeutics and devices, right? Which is devices are just going to get hammered at the margins constantly by these different forces, whereas the, the forces driving drug prices are just significantly different. So the margins, the, the market, the buy times, are, are it, it doesn't mean that it's non-trivial, as you said. I mean, therapeutics are kind of 
binary, their long development times, big cash involved, but the upside is, is significant. Let me throw in one other thing on the device side. It's interesting. I've seen with the device development, some companies want, some companies end up going the, the cash route with their devices, you know, kind of cosmetic route, dental route, where it's fee for service. And then others with the same device, the same kind of applications will actually put it into more of the insurance market. Each one of those has their implications as well for development on the insurance side. Is the hospital going to get reimbursed for the device? Is there a separate CPT code for it? What are those costs going to look like? versus the cosmetic or the, the fee-for-service side, dental side, where I just have to convince the physician to use it and they're going to sell it to their patient or upcharge their services appropriately. That's something else that you always want to kind of talk to management about in terms of the rollout, on, especially on the devices. I'm just a little curious to dig into process a bit. You talked a bit about how to start cultivating deal flow, which I think is great points. It's a lot about networking. That's the starting point. You kind of also indicated there was people that brought deals to you that had experience in the space. I, I sense there's a little bit almost like mentorship, learning from some people who'd done it before. But as you've moved forward, are there some things that you've developed in terms of your process? You kind of indicate the twice a year call. How do you, you know, how do you think about this stuff to the extent that there's some system behind it? And then tied to that, are there any things that you do to continually educate yourself and just kind of keep raising the game other than just the school of hard knocks and learning on the fly? Yeah, so so good questions. So the first part, how do I value? I'll, I'll just put it under a bigger umbrella. How do I directly evaluate a deal? So first is if I hear about a deal that, that I may want to invest in, pretty much everybody should have a pitch deck. If a company doesn't have a pitch deck that tells me they, they probably need some help, their, their management probably isn't experienced. Yeah, don't, don't come in with a sketch on the back of a napkin in a great speech. That's not going to work. Yeah, no, that's not going to work. So I'll, I'll take a look at the pitch deck. And the way the pitch deck is put together also tells me a lot. If they spend a lot of time talking about, oh, we have all these great people involved in the company, and here are these astronomical projections, I'm probably not really interested in that. For me, a pitch deck, it needs to be fairly concise, maybe 10 slides, 10 pages. It needs to tell me what market you're going after, what your product is, how you're unique, and what your barriers to entry are. And then provide me some of those financial projections. But I'll also tell you, I expect to see them, but I ignore them. <laughs> I think you guys have seen enough to know they're never accurate. Exactly. I just want to know that you went through the process of like thinking about your business model, but at the end of the day, anything past a year is pure guesswork anyway. Yeah. yeah. Another take on that. Somebody told me years ago, which I've always thought was uh, insightful. They said, it's less about what the numbers say. I'm looking more to see, to your point, Mike, how, do they know how to think about the problems they're going to encounter? And what are the key things that are going to drive those numbers? The numbers themselves are, are, are somewhat immaterial. 100%. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, as Tyson said, no one, like everybody's got a great idea until they get punched in the face. Right. You know, like every company has their business plan until they hit their first hurdle. But I want to know that you thought about what those errors might be and how will you overcome them and what your sensitivity points are. Yeah. So right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, then if I like the deck and, and I've gotten to the point where I'll look at a deck, you know, maybe five minutes or less, maybe go look up a journal article here or there, just kind of quickly verify what they're telling me. And very quickly, I can tell whether I'm interested in the company or not, and whether I think that they're accurate in their predictions. Do they really know their market? Do they really know what they're getting into? And then if, if I like it, then I want to call with management. I want to talk to the guys that are behind the company, and I want to understand where they come from. You know, if you've done it before, it doesn't mean that you're going to be successful again. You know, all the disclaimers, past, past uh, results don't necessarily predict the future or whatever they are, but that's very true. If you've done it before, you have some idea of what it's going to take. And so I want to talk to management and, and let them give me their pitch and let's see what comes of that. Like I said, if it's something I'm going to do significant diligence on, then I want to go do my own homework. So I want to go research the product as best I can. I want to understand, you know, if it's a drug, I want to understand the, the mechanism behind the drug. I want to see what pre-clinical studies they've done to date to be able to better understand where they're coming from and, and, and where they're going. 
if I'm going to, you know, if it checks all the boxes, I want to look at their intellectual property. I've looked at enough now to have some vague idea that if, if they really have a patent mode or they don't with, as you guys know, with patents, you have used patents and, and design patents. And so, you know, if they have a bunch of design patents around a device, but they don't have a use patent. Right. What good is it? Yeah. What good is it? Fine. Your design is your design, but I can come in with a slightly different design. Right. And I'll move the screw in a different place or I'll yeah. put the wire over here. Yeah. I'll change the color of the darn thing for that matter. Sometimes it's sufficient, right? Yeah, exactly. hundred percent. So, you know, I'll do that. And, and if you don't have the experience to do it, then, then get an attorney, you know, even a basic yeah. attorney, you don't need a high powered patent attorney for, for that kind of a search you know, basic attorney will be able to look at a patent for you and, and give you some idea of what's going on and not a real big deal. I, I wanted to take you back just one moment, and I know it's definitely self-serving for us, but I wanted to ask, ask you something in terms of things like pitch club, those seven minute pitches with the five minute QA, do you find them valuable in terms of oh. an introductory to a company? Yeah, a hundred percent. In fact, I'm about to invest in one of the, the pitch club companies. Excellent. Probably Can you give them an email and let them know, or you were, I assume you've already they, talked to them. They, they know, oh, okay. they, they know excellent. where I came from. Yeah. I mean that, but the seven minute pitch is you should know, you should have an idea with a seven minute pitch, whether a company checks your thesis boxes for investment. It's a first day. It's a first yeah. day. It, it doesn't mean that I'm going to invest, you know, the, the pitch club from Tuesday, a couple of those companies, I'm going to ask some friends about in the GI space because they seem fairly interesting, but, but I still have some questions about it. And I want to talk to the folks in that niche to, to better understand, is this really a problem? Because a lot of times what, what, one of the interesting things I found is a lot of these companies are started by non-physicians are non-healthcare people to deal in the healthcare space. Right. And so they come in and think that there's a problem. And in reality, either there's not a problem or as, as we had talked about earlier, the workflow changes that would result from implementation of their product are insurmountable. People just aren't going to change their workflow. I, I, for honestly, DJ, just so the audience knows, we did not compensate DJ in any way for setting this up. But when you talk about the uh, niche specialties, that's exactly why we use uh, specific specialties to do the evaluations on the companies. Well, but that um, point too, let me just ask yeah, a little bit about please. that. When you look at your body of investments, is there any pattern to the ones that are physician founded or led? Uh -oh. Physicians have an understanding of the space. They're in it day to day. But they also may have other different challenges. But those coming from outside of healthcare, a lot of times, like you said, they underestimate the difficulty of this, that, or the other. Is, is it case by case or are there patterns to, I really like the physician-led companies, particularly in device, or, or is it you know, random? Uh, I think it's, it's random, honestly. In drug development, most of the drugs come out of a university tied to a specific problem or somebody that was out of the university and pulled out or into a private development entity. So I think that is less important to have physicians involved in the development. And drug development is pretty, it's, it's pretty standardized. You got to get FDA approval. You got to go through preclinical studies, phase one, two, three. There's not a lot of variability there. Although there is some, and it is, it is important that people know how to do it. On the device side, I think having physicians involved at some level is extremely important because if you don't use the device, you don't know how to develop it for other people to use. So it may not be that the physician runs the company, but it may be that physicians are involved in the design of the device. And there's one company I ended up not investing with, but, but the patient, the CEO had a really good idea because he was a patient undergoing repeated procedures and realized that part of that procedure process was just painful and there was a better way to do it. And he designed it. He was an engineer and he designed it and he got physicians involved to use the device and iterated the, the process to develop a good device. But I think that's more the exception rather than the rule. I think at the end of the day, it's either you use it or, or in that case, it's been used on you and, and it's hard just to come from the outside with a device. 
in the technology space, I would say it's kind of 50-50. The one company I did invest in the technology space is an outsider. He was involved in healthcare. So not as much an outsider, but he's not a physician. He's not directly involved in healthcare, but his initial idea, I just told him it's not going to work. And sure enough, he went after it and it didn't work, <laughs> you know, but he was able to iterate. He had a good platform. He had a good platform technology. So he was able to iterate which vertical he ended up going into. And so the company's still alive and, and actually doing fairly well. But again, you need involvement of the people that are going to use the technology. Otherwise he had this great idea, but it, it just, it, it didn't work. It, it, and I mean, I told him that the first time I saw him and he spent three years doing it and it didn't work. So he pivoted. That's interesting. We'll just have a couple more questions just to wrap up and, and appreciate your time today. I know you're, you've got, you're in the OR today. So thanks so much yeah, for my doing first this job. before. So one thing, and, and then Mike, I'll let you kind of wrap with any, any final questions you've got. But the one thing I was just kind of going back real quick to how do you continue to hone your game? Are there specific resources, podcasts, books, or groups, or, or how do you think about that? For me, the, the biggest thing is actually seeing how other people invest and talking with other folks involved in investing and with different backgrounds too. When, when I started, it was another physician got me into it. I happened to then meet the business development person for an investment bank and started working with them and just saw how they look at companies from a business standpoint and what models you can put around companies that make them successful looking at how the capital markets work and trying to better understand how do companies get money in the capital markets? When do they do fundraising? What does efficient fundraising look like versus somebody that's just killing value by going out there and raising money on a whim? Because just because a company's in the capital markets, it's publicly traded, doesn't mean the people running the company know finance at all. Uh, and I'm involved in one company right now, great drug. In fact, I just got a nod from the FDA, but they don't know how to raise capital in my view. So, you know, for me, it's more about filling in the gaps that I don't have as opposed to the ones that I do. So through my experience, and, and I've served on hospital boards, I've been on the, the board of a clinically integrated organizations. I've had the ability to see how healthcare how insurance works, how insurance interacts with large hospital systems. I've been on the board of an employer of physicians. So I've seen how those buying cycles run. I work at an ASC that's a joint venture with a hospital system. So I see when I want a dermatome, what the process is that they have to go through to get it for me. A device that multiple people in the facility are going to use doesn't cost that much money, has no upkeep to it, but it still takes a year to buy, you know? It's with that kind of broader knowledge that I come to looking at these investments. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Like one of the things that I've certainly learned over the past, uh, you know, year talking with uh, physicians such as yourselves is that I think the biggest education I had was to put it in a Donald Rumsfeldian way to learn what my unknown unknowns were in the first place. It's like to learn enough about the process in a generalized fashion so that you could then go out and say, okay, now I need to learn more about this. Now I need to learn more about that. And I don't think that comes from anything other than having high quality conversations with other people that are in your space. Like that's the only way you find out that you didn't know that you didn't know that. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think even more, unfortunately, it's from making mistakes. There's not going to be another Best education is an expensive one, as we always used to say. Um, yeah, you know, no, it really is. Um, yeah. Because you're, there, there, you know, Tobin, you know, there's no book out there on investing in startup company or, or what makes a medical device startup company work. Like there's no podcast you can go listen to. There's no book you can buy. There's no online course I can go take for it. You know, and, and I come back to, obviously we're enthusiastic about startups, but I come back to real estate, even real estate, there's not one book out there that really explains the entire process to you. When I look at these companies, the, the other reality I've come to is analysts 
analysts don't know anything more than I know. In fact, in a lot of cases, they know way less. less than I do. I look at some of these companies I've invested in that have now gone public. And I look at, for me, we talked about investing in, in obviously in a startup, you're investing in an idea. You're, there, there's no, you can't look at the financials like you would a Walmart or an Amazon. You can't look at, uh, inv- you know, analyst ratings or investor sentiment or whatever. It's an idea. So you need to fundamentally understand the idea and, and how it's going to be executed. We, we're running into exactly that. It's one of the reasons why we think about the companies as clinical due diligence, because you're not doing due diligence on their financials. There's no valuation metric that you can possibly use other than comps. I mean, what exactly are you looking at other than market size and opportunity, and then whether or not this uh, company is the solution to that problem? Right, right. And, and, you know, for the companies that get out to the public markets, what I've learned is, you know, the analyst, even if they may be an MD, maybe they have an MD degree, you, you really don't fully understand a technology unless you are involved with that technology. You don't understand the market. You don't understand the underlying technology. You don't, they, they have boxes they check when they look at things. They're looking at a whole bunch of different stuff. It, it takes a lot of time to really understand a startup company and what they're, what they're trying to do and, and where they're going. That's why I said, for me, it's about how much time I want to put into that diligence. If it's minimal, but I like the idea in my 10 seconds, speech, my, my seven minute pitch, then I may give them 10% of my yearly allotment just because I think it's a good idea and I want to keep track of it. But if it checks all the boxes and I, sp- I mean, I may spend literally two or three weeks over several months to make a large investment in a company. I've made investments now that are more than 10% of my net worth in an individual company. I don't suggest that for everyone. I think at most, when, especially when you start out, don't put more than 10% of your investments into these kinds of ventures because they are very high risk and you need to spread it out. Be very, very careful. But like I said, I've been doing it long enough and in some of those companies, I feel comfortable enough in their development cycle that it's worth putting in you know, a good, good chunk of change, so to speak, into the company. But that's taken a lot of time and it's taken a lot of effort in, and it still does. I mean, every single company that I, that I come up with, the, the company from Pitch Club, I've, I've had three different calls with them so far. I've, I've had them send me a bunch of papers that I read, you know, at the end of this month, they're, they're going to do their capital call, but you know, it took time. And the other thing with them, I, some of the diligence I've kind of pawned off based on the amount I'm investing because they do have funds that are going to be investing in them. And those funds are doing, are doing some of that legal diligence. Allowing somebody else to take the lead on that investment in order to check your boxes on that front. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's, it's also an amount that I feel comfortable in kind of saying, okay, I'll, I'll trust their diligence, even though I don't know this fund, I'll trust that they're not, they've requested these documents and I think it's, it's probably going to be fine. Um, Dr. (laughs) Barrett, this has been great. There are a lot of topics that I'd like to come back to you and discuss at some point in the future, particularly like the post-investment concept of a backseat driver versus someone that can actually assist an outcome. Because there seems that there's a huge difference there between somebody that's just carping on about what you think they should do versus somebody that can actually go in and say, let me help you with this. Uh, That seems like a whole topic stream that I'd like to come to at some point, but I know we're running out of time. Tobin, I don't know. I'm sure you have some close off questions. As well. Yeah, thank you. Great, great doc. I mean, so rich in, in materials. There's a lot for us to digest. I mean, I, aside from what Mike uh, talked about, we could have a full conversation really around mental models. One of the things I took away was when you went to Pitch Club, you didn't just go there with a blank slate. You've got some things you're looking for, which gives you a filter. Doesn't mean you can't modify that filter, but I think that's something that very few investors, particularly in early stage companies, develop. And it's a it's a huge benefit. But again, thanks a ton for your time here on a Friday. Have a super weekend and more to come. Really appreciate this great conversation and appreciate all your wisdom on the subject. Thanks for having me, guys. Always fun to, to talk shop with you guys. See you again soon for the next episode of Innovation for Alpha. 
Make sure to go to Innovation for Alpha for access to prior episode links, show notes, and other valuable resources. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any investment decisions, please consult with a professional. This show is copyrighted by Angel Indie Media, and written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.